Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live Q&A today. Uh, you know, my name is Danielle Evans, and I am the VP of Success here at Community Funded, and I'm joined by Netta Caligari, one of our really awesome success managers, and of course, our guest host, Lynn Wester. And today, we're going to be doing, uh, you know, a live Q&A on the do's and don'ts of donor engagement throughout this crisis. And seeing that a lot of you have already submitted questions in advance of today, we thank you for being so thoughtful and doing so. All of them have been evaluated and we will be addressing questions both previously submitted and those coming in live today as well. Um, so before I hand things over to Lynn, I will remind you that you are all muted um, if you are attending. And if you have live questions that you wanted to be answered or for us to follow up on, you can use the Q&A part of your Zoom panel to submit the questions to us. If you have other questions about your attendance or the the webinar itself, you can submit them through the chat and you can also expect a follow up from us tomorrow. All right. Well, knowing that you are all looking for ways to move forward during this time and you have goals to hit and expectations on how you actually do so, we've received a lot of questions about whether you should cancel your giving days, postpone them, how you should be communicating with your donors, what you should be communicating about, and most importantly, what are you funding for? And today we're partnering with Lynn to talk to you about the do's and don'ts of really how you can move forward with your donor engagements and the tips and tricks of how to get there. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest host, Lynn Wester. Thanks so much, Danielle. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all, <coughs> trying to provide a little bit of help and inspiration um, to the work that you do that is so important right now. Um, as we all deal with the COVID pandemic, I think it's important to keep into perspective our work and the, the generous souls that support us. And so um, for the, oh my goodness, we've been home four weeks. Um, those of us, I live in Austin, so we're, we've been home for four weeks um, working through a pandemic. And so um, here to provide help, um, I have worked through <clears throat> at post 9-11 and also um, post economic crisis of 2008, but we've not seen anything like this before. So the rule book is being written kind of, or the plane is being flown as we fly it. Um, but I can tell you from your donor's perspective, what works and what doesn't and give you some advice, hopefully to take back to your leadership, um, to your organization, to think about how you implement things, how you communicate with your donors, like what should we be communicating? What are the things that are important for us right now? And also, please keep in mind that your self-care is also important. So taking care of yourself, your families, making sure you stay home and safe and and wealth um, and stay healthy out there is also the best thing you can do is social distance and stay home. Um, you are on the front lines of this as well. So um, I am here to provide um, help and please feel free to submit any questions at any time to the Q&A box and um, we will get to those. But I know Danielle and I and Netta have been collecting some of the questions that you've sent in um, previously. So we're going to start with one of those previous questions and I'm sure lady, one of the ladies is going to give me a prompt so I can answer it. Absolutely. Um, so one of the questions that we received in advance are, what are your suggestions for engaging with donor prospects in an organization that is still building its culture of philanthropy? Yeah, I think it's important that if you're building a culture of philanthropy, first you have to build a culture of generosity and gratitude or an attitude of gratitude. So as you're reaching out, you need to be doing well-being calls and checks, um, videos, emails. Um, first comes hu being human. First comes being vulnerable. First comes taking care of our audience. The fundraising will come later. Um, people will ask you how they can help. They will offer it up. Um, we know that there are two areas that are really booming right now. Donors who are giving through donor advised funds are requesting more of their donor advised funds to go and be sent out. And then corporate giving seems to be booming right now. Um, also, people are um, redoing their estates and life plans. But more than anything, we need to be human and we need to check in on people and make sure they're doing okay. So 
Um, instead of building a culture of philanthropy, maybe we want to think about generosity of spirit uh, and an attitude of gratitude first, and then the philanthropy will come. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, another one of our questions that was submitted in advance of today is what are your top five to 10 do's and don'ts of how to proceed with fundraising during this time? And I think we can Ooh. even split this one up for maybe the top five do's. And then yeah, I think that's great. So on our website, we actually have a whole page donor relations guru forward slash COVID-19 dedicated to resources for you. And it gives you my 12 suggestions during this time. And I can't remember them all off the top of my head. I think the first one is um, to understand that just because fundraising is your priority, it does not mean that it's a lot of your donors priorities in their lives. So yes, they want to help people but here are a few things your donors are thinking about are their parents or their elderly are their loved ones okay and safe how do they keep their family safe um, and COVID free during these times um, how do they deal with the loss of a job or significant loss of income or normalcy in their lives um, how do we um, take care of those that we care about um, and how, for those of them that are parents, how do they homeschool? How do they um, take care of their children and the community? And um, what will it look like when we get out of this? Um, when do I get a vaccine? What's gonna happen to the economy? These are all things that people are wondering about. The number one thing that they're not wondering about is your annual fund in your fiscal year and your unrestricted fundraising. So um, that, is, that is not what they're thinking about. It's not one of the top 10 things on their mind. So I think the first one is getting appropriate perspective. The second one is getting a perspective that there are nonprofits that are providing direct services like um, food banks and um, masks to our healthcare workers and um, Meals on Wheels and other nonprofits that are providing direct services and we need to take a step back and let them lead the way uh, during this crisis. So the third thing is we need to lead with empathy. This isn't about us. This is about the people that care about our organization. So our communications need to be about them. We need to lead by checking in on them and making sure they're, they're okay, um, that they're well taken care of. Um, and our priorities are going to the, to the background. Um, number four is we need to be vulnerable and honest. Um, we need to avoid using phrases like, this is crazy in our communications, or um, you see Ellen got into a bit of trouble because she said, you know, being at home quarantined was like being in prison. It's not like being in prison. We still have our rights and our freedoms. So we need to be careful with our language. Um, and we also need to understand that this is a tough time. And even if, even if your world is still normal, even if you're okay, other people are having a really difficult time. So we need to acknowledge that. And then the fifth one is get out there and communicate one-on-one, -on -one, embrace tech, embrace digital. It's something that we in nonprofit land don't embrace technology very well. We hate change. We hate technology. We can't stand it. Guess what? Now you're forced to use it and you might as well embrace it. And so I really think it's important for us to think how can we take and seize this opportunity so that we can help our, our communities. You know, your alumni are, un, you know, a lot of them are unemployed. What are you doing to provide them employment resources? What are you doing to help them fix their resumes? You know, we have people who are struggling mentally. What are we doing to help them um, provide a bit of peace, uh, a bit of um, self-care in this time. Um, we have people struggling in a lot of ways. Um, we have college students who've been sent home from something that was supposed to be the best four years of their lives, and that's not going to be the case. So that's my top five tips. Um, and again, we have a document on our COVID website. Um, it's donorrelationsguru.com. And then um, you, there's a COVID link right at the top, and it provides tons of resources for you for free. Thank you, Lynn. And we have a lot of folks asking in our chat right now and Q&A about sharing that link. I will post it and then we will also share it in our follow-up. Great. Perfect. So. And somebody just posted it as well in the Q&A. So Thank you for doing that. Appreciate you. Um, so that's great. So, um, so I have a question 
in the Q and A and keep sending your Q and A in. We're gonna, I'll get to those live first and then we'll go back to the pre sent in ones if we don't have live. Um, she says, uh, she or he, sorry, says we had an annual fund appeal drop at the beginning of March. We're receiving checks and online gifts in response to that, knowing we likely won't have a way to send hard copy acknowledgement letters until we're cleared to return to the office. Should we send email acknowledgements with a mailed hard copy when possible? So <clears throat> there's two documents you should be sending after someone makes a gift. One is a receipt and one is a acknowledgement. So the receipt is your IRS tax documentation. Um, normally we send those out in the way in which a person gives. So if they give online, we send them digitally. If they give in the mail, we send them out in print. Um, now you want to email their tax receipt. So that is great that you've been doing that. And then for the acknowledgement, I would think that you could do a platform like ThankView where you have a video. If you can't get a hold of ThankView and, and that's not a fit for your organization, you could record it on your phone, record a video, record a voice message, but email is perfectly acceptable right now to do your thank yous. Um, and remember that a lot of people are not, you know, going to their mail as often as they used to. And some people are a little leery of things coming in the, in the postal mail right now. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and so take this opportunity to digitize your acknowledgements um, on the link that is the COVID resource page. There's also a sample acknowledgement that you can send out that acknowledges COVID. So please feel free um, to take advantage of that. Um, all of your acknowledgements should be changed right now so that you can acknowledge what's happening and that their support mean, means more now than ever. So absolutely. Um, so I'm glad that helped you says, great tips for outreach. What would you say about communicating and engaging with people in our audiences who do not embrace or have access to technology? Big New York Times article recently about how online learning is exposing great variants among college students' lives. One on Zoom at family vacation home, another on Zoom in the parents' food truck. That is true of our donors too. What about non-tech? Um, so yeah, you know, uh, during every crisis we expose great equality, um, especially in America. Um, so that's something to grapple with. Um, I think that for the most part, a lot of are do have technology. Um, they may not be using it. They may not be embracing it in the same way. A handwritten thank you note still rules the day. Um, and so um, you want to think about that. But in terms of engagement, right now, it's simply not um, advised you know, you can't do in-person engagement. Um, you can't do, um, you know, gatherings of people that don't require technology. Um, and I don't know that I'd be sending out my normal alumni magazine right now. So um, I think, I think that, yes, there are, um, you know, you can always pick up the phone and call people, um, knowing that, you know, less than 20% of Americans have a landline now. So they're, um, you know, they're, they're primarily going to be on their cell phones. So texting is another way. Um, even if they don't have Wi-Fi or computer, they have cell phones. I, I don't, you know, there are more cell phones out in the world than there are toothbrushes. So that should make you feel good about that. Um, but I, I, I don't have a hard and fast about the non-tech. Um, I think you'd be surprised at how many people have tech. Um, but you may not have their email address. So a lot of organizations are doing, um, they're employing their student callers, they're employing staff that otherwise would have been furloughed to call students, to call donors and ask them for email addresses, ask them for ways um, to, um, to help. So that would be really, hey, the questions are coming in. I love this. Um, many of us are coming to the end of our fiscal year and the middle of planning review Revenue for FY21. Many people are shifting giving that would usually come later in the year to this early part of the calendar year. Any thoughts about how to incorporate COVID changes in giving to our revenue projections? Um, <clears throat> so here's fiscal year, and it, the timing is <clears throat> not serendipitous for you that your fiscal year. Um, I'm going to hold up an image to my camera. I, I know it's a janky way of 
I'm doing it, but really the only way I have of showing you this image. Um, I'll email it to my girls, um, Danielle and Netta, and they'll get it out to you. But this is what fundraising looks like after a crisis. You know, we have this spike, which is what's happening now. And then we're going to bottom out depending on the economy, and then we'll slowly rise again. So it's the bump, the slump, and the surge. That's what they're calling it in this article. So there's a surge in emergency giving. People who are giving to direct cause-related activities. Then we get a lower than normal um, giving, and then we come back. And we saw that in 2008 as well. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we have not um, seen the drop-off yet. People are still giving, um, <clears throat> and they're giving generously. Those who are high net worth individuals still are high net worth, excuse me, individuals. And so, um, but, your fiscal year end is not a reason for someone to give. Um, they're giving because you're telling them about how you've been impacted by um, your revenue is going to be down. Uh, it's just honest. Um, you know, um, one in four households has someone who is unemployed or furloughed as a result of COVID. And I think that will continue to grow. There are projections that say that we're going to get to 30% unemployment if this continues on and it will continue on. Um, I'm a realist. So I want, I want to be as honest with you all as possible that this whole idea of returning to normal is crap. There is no returning to normal and it's not going to happen in the next five minutes. So hang on. And in terms of the economy, um, I'm a small business owner. I'm in a group of tons of small business owners and not a single dime has flown yet has been, has, has been submitted to small business owners. A lot of people who've implied for unemployment don't have unemployment. So <clears throat> it's going to be tough. So your revenue is going to be down. So at, what you need to communicate to your leadership is participation, retention of your current donors. Those are the two revenue goals I'd be going for in, 20, in FY21. I wouldn't be going for a dollar amount. I'd be going for how many donors can we retain, even if it's at a lowered level, and then how many donors can we get to participate? That's, that's what I'd be thinking about as well. Um, okay, what benefits from the CARE Act are best to share with donors and prospects? Are there any points that be highlighted or mentioned when engaging and soliciting with the donor? So, <laughs> um, this is probably gonna get me in some hot water, so hold on, Danielle and Netta. Um, so this whole idea of this CARES Act and how it's gonna affect profit fundraising is bunk. Um, most Americans who are your donors aren't eligible for the $1,200 check. They make more than $75,000. So they're not getting a, the, one of the $1,200 checks. So that money isn't going to come to you. Um, then this $300 credit, that's not a lot to make a difference on someone's taxes in the high net worth range, in your donor base range. So in reality, the CARES thing sounds good. Um, it'll be there to help bail out the nonprofits once they start the money flowing from the CARES Act, but it's certainly not a reason why a donor's gonna give. I think one of the things we learned coming out of the 2017 tax cut, especially around athletics and other things, is that donors aren't giving for tax purposes. Our giving didn't fall off a cliff because they don't get tax credit for it. So I would not be bringing that up with my donors. Um, I would not be mentioning the $1,200 economic stimulus. Um, you know, one in one third of all rent in April did not get paid. One third of all rent in the United States did not get paid in April. So we also need to think about that. So I don't think the CARES Act is something I would share with people. That's my personal and professional opinion right now. So here, hang on hang on to that, that wording until the incentive gets much better. <clears throat> so how do you help align different departments fundraising priorities, which is with a centralized unified university message? Huh. The only fundraising priority that matters right now is COVID related emergency. So I have told all of my people and my clients and, and do not stop fundraising but you cannot fundraise for anything that's not COVID related until we can get toilet paper back on the shelves. So, and still, that's my line. I'm sticking with it. I've stuck with it 
four weeks ago and I'm sticking with it now until I can walk into Target and pick up as much Lysol wipes and as much toilet paper as I want. You can't fund for departments fundraising parties. You can only ask for COVID related expenses. And there's plenty of those out there at your organization. The expense to have your employees work from home, the expense to cover payroll and healthcare for furloughed employees. Um, there are expenses out there. You can't raise for unrestricted funding or for things that are not emergencies right now. So um, you really have to think about that. You really have to think about that. Great question, great question. Um, uh, uh, anonymous attendee. I love anonymous attendee. We are very heavy with fall fundraising events. <laughs> Do we need to cancel all of them? Any creative suggestions on pivoting for golf tournaments, other large outdoor indoor events? We still have big revenue goals to hit. Yeah, this is, um, this is the question I didn't want to get. <laughs> Well, uh, so I'm going to speak to you really and honestly and, 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 and first of all, by saying to you deep breath, because I know you have revenue goals to hit. We're a, we're going to be inside a lot longer than we think we're going to be. If you think on May 1st, we're all going to go Ali Ali oxen free. We're not going to, the peak is not going to hit every state until May, you know, their states aren't going to peak until May in mid May. I, I personally and professionally don't believe we will have in-person events in 2020, um, including in fall. Um, I can't imagine that people are going to want to gather in large crowds until we have two things. And this, my knowledge here comes from Dr. Fauci. He's my dude. Um, Dr. Fauci is my dude. He's the only person I get my COVID knowledge from. And two days ago, he said, I don't think we should be having events until we can test every single in that event and we have a vaccine. So, and most of your donor events are going to be people above the age of 60, which are people who are in danger. Um, I also think that by having events, we could create another resurgence of COVID. Um, I don't think you're going to have donor events with people wearing masks. Like, this is not a fun donor event, is it? I can't talk. I can't eat my, nobody's going to, now that I know that nobody eat, washes their hands, I'm never eating off of a buffet again. Like, ew, you people are nasty out there. Not you guys, but people are nasty. Um, and I think we're going to have a really tough time gathering people. So, yeah, you can use the what I call my drinking word, which is pivot or reimagine um, I don't think it's, 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 it's smart to have golf tournaments um, or other large outdoor indoor events. You have revenue goals to hit. Great. Wonderful. Hit them in another way. Um, do virtual events. I was talking with my friend Ron who runs Wired Productions today. And um, he and I are going to work on how do we do some virtual events um, and some virtual events tech. So stay tuned for that. We're going to be posting that eventually on our website, but in person isn't going to happen. And then the other thing is, is once I do get the Ali Ali oxen free, do you actually think that I'm going to come to your event rather than travel to Vegas or go to a beach or hug my parents or go hang out with my best friends? Your events aren't going to be what I want to do with my free time. So um, that is my take on events. Sorry, swallow big. It's going to be okay, but not because I just don't think it's responsible to even be thinking about events at this point, other than how do we turn that into regular fundraising. And the silver lining of all of this COVID is we're getting rid of events that we never needed in the first place. People don't need to gather um, in that. And um, events-based fundraising costs 50 cents to raise a dollar. Real person-to-person -person fundraising costs 12 cents to raise a dollar. So now you're going to streamline your fundraising and do big boy and big girl fundraising, which I like. So um, I, I like that a lot. Um, so sorry about your events. Tamika, Tamika, hi! Oh my God, Tamika and I go way, way back. You talked about engagement over fundraising. What about asking donors to support student emergency funds? Yes, Tamika, dead on. We can support some emergency funds. But let me say this to everybody who um, is um, talking about student emergency funds. Um, you should make sure that you have a plan for 
spending those funds and reporting back on those funds before you go out and raise that money. Because with the swiftness to which you requested it, I want the swiftness to how you report on it. So no more of that, oh, we're saving it for a rainy day. Um, no more of that, um, well, professor held onto it, didn't spend it. I want to see what you spent that emergency funding on. And it's okay to spend it on, you know, getting a student home or, um, you know, uh, rent for the students. I, I, that's fine. You got to tell me what you spent it on. So yes, emergency funds, you can still fundraise for. Good. Um, okay, I've got another on anonymous person. Um, uh, let's see. Hi there, our gala. Um, is coming up on May 2nd, which is now virtual. I was like, mm. um, do you have any specific advice on messaging outreach to encourage participation that is sensitive while also communicating the or organization's needs? <clears throat> um, so uh, if your need right now, so on May, you should be fundraising for COVID related emergency funds. Um, you can't be raising money on May 2nd for things that you've got to be raising money for things that you have to have. You know, we need to go back to, to um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, folks, and understand that food, shelter, safety, health, those are the things that have become so precious to us. So if it's a want and not a need, um, then say that that would be very successful no matter how much you um, think you have needs, you're going to have to really evaluate your organization and what your needs are. And you're going to have to make some cuts so that people understand what a need is. So um, I think, you know, I, good luck to you. I think also make sure that if you're going to do any kind of an auction, that those items are going to be there when the auction is over. So Somebody said to me, well, we've collected all these hotel room nights and restaurant gift certificates and things like that. And I'm like, how do we know that restaurant is going to make it after the gala? So you're going to auction off a gift card that may be for a restaurant that's closed or a hotel that doesn't open. Remember, not everybody's going to make it after this. It's very hard to run a business right now, especially in hospitality. So be very careful there. <clears throat> um, okay, I have someone who says, Users <clears throat> have pretty much exhausted the check-in calls to their donors. Really? So they've reached every single person. Okay. Any other unique and creative ways to com keep communications lines open with their donors? Yeah. So what are you providing as a value? First of all, have they, have they contacted every single donor in their portfolio plus every single donor who's given 10 or more years consecutively at any amount to your organization plus any donor who's ever given a plan gift, those are, when you've exhausted that list, cool. Then you need to start providing engagement that is value, right? So what kind of resources can you provide for my family? Like LSU is doing this great LSU Arts at Home program. The University of Tennessee is doing um, social media takeovers and they have coloring book pages. What value are you providing while I'm at home? Is it a cocktail recipe? Because Lord knows I'm drinking more than ever. Is it a cooking recipe? Because I need something to hold down the cocktails. You know, what kind of value? Is it video performances? What are you providing um, to me? And remember, don't over communicate. We've only been, you know, work from pandemic for four weeks. I don't need six touches from my gift officer. I, I still have to like shower and stuff. And apparently I've got to work too. So, you know, we also don't different reach outs do some nice blanketed things um, that are meaningful to people but it but make sure that they've reached out and gotten to everybody first rob is direct mail worth doing at all absolutely rob if direct mail is done right it's absolutely worth doing so depending on your part of the country every part of the country uh, and so for example in california a lot of them aren't checking their mail in texas you know they're a little uh, less, uh, you know, Texas, they're out and whether we want them to be or not. So I think there are people, my parents are 82 and 84. They're not checking their mail right now. Um, they've signed up 
So this speaks to the case for what we call informed daily digest. Um, there's a postal service program that you can have that tells you an email every day what's coming to your mailbox. It's called informed daily digest. And so every single time you send out directly, you should be sending out a rider image with informed daily digest so that your direct mail has a clickable link where they can click and without ever going to their mail. So um, I think that's um, a great thing to do right now. Um, but is your mail good? You know, and what are you asking for money for? So if you're calling this an emergency, but it's not, then direct mail won't work, won't work. But yes, direct mail is not dead. Good direct mail is, is working. Andrea, can we ask donors to support student scholarships for 2021? Absolutely, because you're, you know, one of the big pro problems in higher education is we're gonna have retention issues with students. So, um, for example, I live in Austin, the University of Texas is online classes all the way through August. Um, and we don't know what the fall semester is gonna look like. So for some students who are paying a lot for their degree, um, why would um, they, um, go to the same university when they can go online to a different university for much less. So I think there's going to need to be retention scholarships for a lot of students. So that's be something I'd be looking into. But financial aid, that's great. As long as it's not padding, you know, and as long as it's, it's truly needed, then absolutely. Absolutely. Karen, athletics is a decentralized fundraising unit from Central. Oh, honey, it always is. I love my athletics departments. Though they aren't currently asking for money, <clears throat> the cancellation of rental income with such supplements, our ops budget will see us losing 150 to 200 K this fiscal, not renting will impact FY21. When is appropriate let know the impact of our department? Karen, we're all missing sports. I am, I missed March Madness. I missed, you know, things like the mask. I think a lot of us who are sports folks are missing sports greatly. Um, and I, I think, but I think um, as much as it's an essential part of my life, I think people still see it as a nice to have, not a have to have. I think um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with our fall. Um, you know, if we cancel or postpone or don't have audiences in our football stadiums, for example, that's 90% of most athletics departments ticket revenue. That's going to wipe out some schools, athletics departments, you know, that supports the other 19 sports at a lot of universities. So um, I don't necessarily, I don't think right now, now is the time to talk about losing rental income um, from buildings that are already paid for. Um, I, I think we're till, still too early in this to talk about that at this point. Um, I'd be more concerned about what's happening to scholarship students. For example, um, Texas A&M, just if their students, you know, the students who've been spring scholarship athletes, that's going to cost them an extra $565,000 in scholarship money. That's different than rental income. So <clears throat> I'd be doing, <clears throat> excuse me, much more student focused things than income like that. So great question though. Great question. Great question. <clears throat> Laura, how do you feel about asking scholarship donors to change their donation to COVID or general use for the next fiscal year? I don't feel like that at all. I don't, I don't know. So here's the thing, Laura, donors have their preferences and, um, and what's going to happen if you try to change my restriction or if you ask me, you know, here's our greatest need. Some people are going to give to your greatest need, but if I'm already giving to scholarships and you say, we'd rather have it for COVID support, I will give a smaller amount for COVID support, but I still, you know, as a scholarship donor, that's what they want to support. So I don't think we should be changing their mind on that one or attempting to change their mind. So think about that. Yep. Um, Judy, how do you continue fundraising for your annual fund to fulfill the budget for the year? You don't. <laughs> you don't. That now is not the time to take care of your annual fund budget for the year. Look, most universities are incurring expenses, 40, 50, 60 million dollars just to move their classes online. Uh, and your annual fund that raises what, two or three million or maybe 10 million if you're at a big school, that's gonna be a drop in the bucket compared to what they have to make up. We, we in fundraising, it's not our job to save the budget of the university or budget of the, um, <clears throat> budget of the, um, 
uh, of the organization. It's it's not our job to to save our to save our organizations, and the annual fund isn't going to save your organization. And donors aren't going to want to give to an unrestricted slush fund. I know I'm not going to. So um, I'll tell you, as a as a donor myself, uh, um, and as a small business owner. Um, when I do finally loosen up the strings on my philanthropy, I'm going to tell you who I'm going to support. Grocery store workers, delivery drivers, nurses, radiologists, anesthesia, the people who were the last source keeping us home, helping us out. I want to pay off their student loans. I want to send them to Disney World. Like I, the people that work in an Instacart help and keep me in groceries so I don't have to go to the grocery store. The people, those are the people I want to support right now. I don't want to support the annual fund. I love my alma mater, but my annual fund money is going to be going to places that really need it. So because we have endowments and stuff, we'll be fine. We will be fine. So I'm not trying to make up the whole annual fund um, in one fail swoop. It's not my responsibility. These are all great questions. You guys are killing it with the questions. And some of you are loving my straight shooting, even though you're probably crying in your beer right now. It's okay. So um, how do you maintain loyal support with current donors who panic and potentially taper off their giving because their investable net worth has been cut by 30% in the last three weeks? So I talk to people who have donor advised funds. I talk to people about a participatory gift um, because I'm not asking them for the same amount they gave last year. I'm just asking for a participatory gift. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the market. We don't know what's going to happen with our endowments. Likely our endowments are going to be down, but that's why we have that money. Um, it's, you have to ask them for the right thing at the right time. People want to be generous. People want to step up and help your organization, but they want to first see plan to get through this. So they're not just going to support you because you're broke all of a sudden. So if you didn't save and your organization didn't plan for this, we all knew a pandemic was possible. We all had redundancy plans. I had a work remote plan. Um, you know, I've had savings. Like this is not, this should not be a surprise to anyone. We thought it was going to be like bird flu or Ebola. We didn't know um, about this. Um, uh, so, um, I think you have to give people the opportunity to give a participatory gift back and donate later. So, um, but donor advised funds, things like that, um, are good. Um, Amy, how, without events this coming year, how can I get my board on board with knowing the reality of our future? I, not in person events, no, but why couldn't you do that virtually? Why couldn't you sit on here just like this and um, have your board uh, know the reality, put up the charts and tell them that? To me, that's a really simple, easy. The board is the last, no offense, but the board are the last people I'm worried about. Right now, I'm, I'm worried about a lot of other things um, other than my board. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's just one of the things I'd be thinking about. Um, I have a question from uh, uh, Amy says, my board is very scared to do anything online right now. I don't know why I'm living, like all of us are living our whole lives right now. Um, you, know, you know, Gonzaga University had an amazing event on Hope and they had 400 people attend it. And that was two days ago. I, I, um, they think it's insensitive. Well, they're going to be slow to the game because everybody else is jumping online. So I think it's your job then to, can, to lead up and to convince your board that there, you can have a vast community online. Um, and it's not insensitive right now. I mean, it's not like you're, you're having it during someone's funeral. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're building a community. You're bringing people together. I don't think what anything's, you know, and we've seen so many people want to get together. For example, um, We've seen DJ Nice play to 200,000 people. He's a DJ and 200,000 people a week tune in to hear him DJ so that we can dance and, and move our butts during this pandemic while we're cooking. And like last week, Lil Jon and, and um, T-Pain had a song off and like 400,000 people joined it. And like turn up for what? So you know what? People are online. Um, they want to gather. So we got to do that. 
Um, Cindy has a good question though. I want to get to this because I have a, <clears throat> I have a real strong opinion about this, Cindy. So here we go. Buckle up. It's our 60th anniversary. Enter cl any clever way of changing our year and go for it 2021. Here's the harsh reality, Cindy, about your um, anniversary. Um, is, um, oh, this is awful. The only people that really, really strongly care about your anniversary are you guys. Um, donors don't give because of big anniversaries for your organization. Um, they're not particularly inspired because you made it for 60 years, uh, because you'll have a 75th and then a 90th and then a 100th. We haven't seen those inspire lots of things. So I actually think your 60th isn't um, that important. Um, and so, um, sorry, but I wouldn't move it to the 20. To 2021, I would just keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Not a, not a lot of people are going to want to, you know, get that strong sense of urgency because it's your anniversary. Um, I have a couple of questions on here that I'm going to group together um, about stewarding emergency funds. So how often should we uh, be updating these donors about the use of the fund and the progress being made? So here's my thing about stewarding emergency funds. We all hurried and we switched gears and we're asked for money about them. Um, we should do reporting back with the same sense of urgency. So if the money comes in, if you were raising $200,000 um, for an emergency fund, then you need to tell me, hey, that was spent and we're out and now we need more and here's what we spent it on. So, you know, that's, you know, quickly. So if, if you've been fundraising, I want every two weeks an update on what are you doing for your emergency fund. I don't think it's unrealistic because you're saying you have emergent needs. So now you need to tell me what you spent those emergent needs on, right? You can't just pass this over. Um, so you can't, you can't do that. You've got to, um, you've got to focus on those emergency funds and you've got to report back of, um, really thinking about how to spend those and how to get that turned around, um, so that you can report on them. Um, let's see, our university is planning on sending a mail solicitation fundraising for our student emergency fund. We have lots of budget dollars available. Do you think we should send this letter to all constituents at this time or only send to live but current donors? Participation is important, but I'm concerned the ROI will be nor more than normal. Jeffrey, don't spend that money on direct mail to non-donors. Spend that money on a video program like a thank view, on a virtual event, getting it produced. Spend that money on professional development for your team. Spend that money on um, great video content and digital content. Create a nice digital, uh, put spiral up a crowdfunding platform. Um, do not spend that money on talking to non-donors, trying to convince them to give, right? So spend that money on your lie bunts um, only for current donors. Invest the best future donor is the donor you have now. So um, absolutely what you want to be thinking about. So excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, uh, anonymous, talking about student athlete scholarships will likely cost us 800K to a million to support those returning students. We've had donors ask about supporting those returning athletes. Is it too early to start fundraising for this? Or do we need to wait until toilet paper is back on the shelves? I think you can have private conversations with donors. I certainly don't think that you can do, so if a donor says, hey, I want to help you with those increased costs, great. The average scholarship amount is X. How many students fund? That's what I would say. But the other thing you need to do is get from your coaches how many athletes they actually think are going to come back and what that gap looks like. So our estimates are 800K to a million. Great. How much does it cost for one student? And then ask donors, how many students do you want to buy? How, how many, you know, how do you want to buy? Love that. Um, that's great. So Leah says, would it be okay to post a link to a previous championship game and encourage the alums to wear their college team shirts that day and host a social media watch party? Yeah. So two weeks ago, um, the uh, ESPN, because God, can you imagine working at ESPN right now? Those poor bastards. They are dying trying to watch like flip cup and stuff. Like I feel awful for them. But 
they aired the Texas USC game, the, the greatest game of all time, the national championship football game. People on Twitter, all the athletes involved were commenting. Love that idea. Love that idea. So that's a great one. That's a great one. That's, that's a really, a really good one. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good one. So Anonymous asked, um, uh, how do you address um, following up on pledges uh, made prior to COVID-19? Put all your pledge reminders on hold. Um, if I received an invoice um, or a pledge reminder from someone right now, they would never get another dime from me. Never, never, never get another dime from me. So, um, you know, I would be really upset, upset. Um, so hold on your pledge reminder and you need to hold on to them. So now's not the time. Now's not the time. Uh, Emily says, do you have any resources for hosting a medium scale 300 person virtual event? I do. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a webinar. Um, Emily, if you go to my website, Donor Relations Guru, um, and sign up for our email list. We're going to do a webinar with a production company that does these so that you can see how it's going to go, what kind of resources you need, things like that. So um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yep, I'm answering all of the pledge reminder questions. No go. That's a, that's a hard pass. That's, that's the Wakanda symbol, but it's also a hard pass. Um, uh, put your pledge reminders on hold until we get Ali Ali Oxen free at least. Um, or we see, well, uh, reminders have to go on hold until the government starts paying people, small businesses, um, unemployment. We need to see how big this is going to be. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So someone said, once the stay at home order is lifted and we start getting back to a sense of normalcy, where do we even begin? Okay. So sorry to depress y'all, but um, there is not going to be a sense of normalcy. There's going to be a new normal after COVID, but it may not occur after the stay at home order is going to be lifted because there's a lot of people that still um, don't believe that um, when we get the lifting that that's going to be the right decision. So people are going to be hesitant. Um, it's going to change the landscape of our work for a long time. So it's going to be a new normal. We're going to have to think about that, but guys, we're so far away from that. We're, I know, I know I'm an extrovert who spends 300 nights a year in a hotel room. I'm not having a great time right now, but I mean, I, I'm love being around you guys, but I want this to end at the end of April, but it's not, it's not going to, we're, you know, it, we're going to be home for a long time, guys. So let's talk about new normal when we get you through the daily life here. So Let's talk about that. Um, I can't tell you about your giving day in mid-October um, because I don't know what we're going to look like. It's all going to depend on whether we stay at home and, and, you know, if people are dying still, I don't know how we can have, you know, the same old, same old. So I think we have to be, I think we ha really have to be sensitive to that. Um. Why is giving through a donor advised fund preferable now? <clears throat> it's people who have donor advised funds. So what happens is in a donor advised fund, the, my financial manager says, okay, for tax purposes, put $25,000 in the donor advised fund. So that way you'll get the tax benefit this year. I say, okay, I put the $25,000 in. Three years later, I've still got $20,000 in there. Those are donors you want to talk to because it's not affecting their liquidity to give out of their donor advised fund. So those are people I want to talk to because the money's sitting there. It doesn't come out of their wallets, right? So that, that's good money to go and solicit. So I'd be getting a list of everybody who's ever given through a Fidelity, um, <clears throat> um, uh, what is one my dad uses, Morgan Stanley, any of those community foundations, anybody who has given through any of that, and I'd be calling all asking them for an additional emergency gift during this time out of their donor advised fund. So that is what I would be doing. So that's great. Um, what about people in our portfolio who are at the qualification stage? Absolutely. Start, doesn't mean you can't build a relationship. So Karen, just to give you a giggle, 
I was uh, texting with my graphic designer video producer today and I and he's an introvert and he's like he's like this is kind of like my normal life just with more food and I'm like I'm dying I'm not dying but I, this is hard for me uh, he goes well hey I've had virtual dates in the last two weeks and I'm like are you kidding me and he's like no it's great I don't even have to buy him a drink and I can get rid of whether they we fit it or not and I'm like oh my god you're and I'm like stress eating Doritos for breakfast like oh my god we're just in places but yeah so it's okay to start a relationship with someone who's in discovery phase and they might really appreciate having a new person to talk to so I see no reason why you can't do exploratory and figure out your portfolio it's a it's a great time to make connections with human beings again to be human being human is really um, important. Um, Danielle, um, we plan to go public with our major campaign in June. Of course we are not now. What do you suggest we do? It's a great question, Danielle. I assume you mean like a comprehensive campaign, like, you know, a couple hundred million or a billion. My friend Angie is, there's a campaign on 10, 10, 20, 20. And so um, they were gonna have a big event weekend and everything. And so um, we're looking into options of delaying it because donors weren't, like donors don't know the difference between silent phase and public phase of your campaign. And, and um, I think we think they care a lot more about our stuff than they do. Remember, we're just one of the organizations they give to. I would say postpone until 2021. That's what I would do. Or, <clears throat> have a if we can have in-person events having a small uh, event with a virtual component but I would be postponing but nothing I wouldn't be out there in June uh, launching a campaign right now so um, Donna says our campaign consultant encouraged us to send out reminders as pro as appropriate um, uh, they recommend that we don't want to make the decision for them um, they, we will include messaging that allows the flexibility to pay later. One opinion, I just am not sending out pledge reminders right now. None of my clients are going to do that. So um, it's too, too soon, too soon to be sending out pledge Um If we have future gala events scheduled for the fall, should we not be sending out save the date? No. I would not be sending out a save the date. Um, I have an event for a client that's supposed to be October 20. We're not sending out a save the date because we just don't know. We just don't know um, whether or not um, people are gonna, yeah, we just don't know. And I don't wanna waste the money on a save the date. Um, so just something like that. Um, we launched a COVID crowdfunding campaign. Yay, think it on your feet, being adaptable, we love it. Uh, community funding like for your crowdfunding campaign right okay um we plan to run it through the end of april oh no much longer leadership has asked that we consider extending it through june i don't think you put an end date on it look uh how do i say this without making you depressed um there are a lot of people for whom this is just the tip of the iceberg and they have not seen bad yet meaning um the longer this goes and the longer people go without income the longer people go without um, resources, without jobs, without, I mean, June, June is the least of, yeah, keep it going. Keep it going. Good question, but keep it going. Um, end of April, that's just one month. That's just one month of rent, one month of groceries, one month of everything. So, um, you know, I really think, I really think you should think about that um, in terms of, um, your organization. Um, when you say student focus, do you see public education foundations relevant during this time? Yes. I think that there are student public education foundations that are out there providing iPads and laptops and hotspots. And I've seen so many of them focus and say, here's all of our money. What does the school district need? And so um, I think there's going to be a lot of that. I think when school children come back, there's going to be a lot of remediation that needs to happen. Um, not because parents aren't good teachers, but who can work two jobs in a household and teach full time and cook three 
Like these parents, my friend Ashley has a two-year-old and a six-year-old and I just want to send her, like, she's like, <clears throat> my Gartner got this and we have to scan it and we have to print 75 pages. And I'm like, why don't you put your kid in front of Lion King and let him play outside? That's what kindergarten is about, naps and snacks and stuff. And she feels like she's being a failure. And, you know, it's kindergarten, you know? So I think we need to support our schools, but I also think we need to support our parents. And kids are going to have a tough time coming out of this, especially if they um, unfortunately lost someone. So, you know, we have to think about that. Or mom and dad lost a job. That's really tough to have that happen with a parent. So... Okay, I have about five minutes. So Ned is going to wrap us up. I have so many good questions we're going to answer. We're going to add these unanswered questions to our list for next time. Um, we're going to be back on next Thursday, but Ned is going to wrap you up so I can chug some water. I hope this was helpful, um, but Ned, take it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lynn. This was super insightful. Um, your guidance is so appreciated. I noticed a couple of quotes in the chat here that I'm going to read off. You are a breath of fresh air and hilarious, and your energy is so great, and you're brightening people's days. So thank you again for partnering Community Funded, and I know we could go on for hours <laughs> because there's a gazillion questions. I know. Please drink that water. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your time again today. Thank you again to all of the participants, everyone who joined in. Um, we will be following up with a recording of the webinar, additional resources. Of course, you know, you can see how knowledgeable Lynn is. So please reach out to her at Donor Relations Guru. Um, she's happy to connect with you there. And also us here at Community Funded, we do have a really awesome platform for digital engagement and moving events online. So if you have any questions about that, um, go to our site, communityfunded.com. Um, we can set you up with a, um, a trial, a free consultation. We're here for you as well, um, because we know it's really important during this time to move your events online, um, have a strong digital engagement and really fundraise for um, those immediate needs in your communities. And thanks to Danielle as well for helping moderate uh, our time together. So, you know, because we have so many questions, of course, we'll be following up, but Lynn was gracious enough to uh, keep, continue to partner with us. So we'll be doing another webinar next week. Uh, we will also be sending that information out uh, with this recording um, and how you can sign up for that next week. So stay tuned. There is more to come. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining in today. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.